Unlike the Nine Hells, which has a set and defined number of layers and locations, the Abyss is infinite, a never-ending realm of chaos and demons. It is the most inhospitable place in the entirety of the multiverse. But what are its secrets? Why and how is it infinite? What truly lies in the deepest nether regions of this abyssal land? Is Zimor Gorgon truly its ruler, or is there something else that governs from the shadows? A primordial force from times long past. Today, we will uncover the beginnings of the Abyss, its history, its legacy, and what lies deep at the heart of this infinite landscape of doom. But before we do that, I am incredibly happy to announce a project that I have been finally able to complete. This here is a PDF that I have personally written called What They Don't Tell You About Dragon Hordes. It took me months to get this thing here ready for you guys, but I am extremely happy with how it came out. The art is gorgeous and I managed to put into writing so many ideas that Dungeons and Dragons just was not simply giving us. And you guys know me, I care a lot about creature biology, and one of the biggest asks for Fistbank's Treasury of Dragons, which is a dragon book coming out soon, was to have dragon harvesting, but they, of course, would not give us that, and so that's what I did. I did a ton of research and I managed to put together a chapter that would help you guys figure out how to properly harvest and utilize the magical properties of a dragon's body. Dragon blood, for example, is extremely potent and can be used for some really wild magical rituals. In fact, you can even drink dragon blood and it is supposed to give you tons of benefits. In the PDF here, we have rituals that utilize the brains of dragons, their eyes, bones, and even their draconic fundamentum, which is an organ that creates their elemental properties. Hey, look, D&D wouldn't give this to you, so I had to. And we obviously have tons of stuff too on dragon scales and how much you need in order for you to create armor. We also have a chapter for draconic magical items, from things that you can create with dragon parts, to stuff used to kill dragons, to another feature that is completely left out of current Dungeons and Dragons books, which is uh, magic items that are meant for dragons to use. It is always weird when you fight dragons and they have like 30 magical items on their horde, yet for some whatever reason they just never use any of them and they just fight you with their claws and, and teeth, like that is just silly. And the thing is, there's a lot of really cool dragon items in the lore, so I wanted to go back and recreate them and bring them here for 5th edition just so that you guys could use them. Uh, there's some really cool legendary ones and an artifact weapon as well. I also made some draconic related subclasses that I know you guys would love. Like for example, oh god bro, we have been asking for an otherworldly patron for warlocks, uh, for dragons. And we were hoping that Dungeons and Dragons would give us that on fist banks, and they literally didn't. So I went and created one that I think is one of the coolest things that I have ever created. Otherworldly patron, the Great Worm. It's actually sick. You get to turn into a half dragon at the end of it, following a ritual where you bathe in dragon blood, which is a real thing, by the way, in D&D lore. Uh, you can find the PDF right here, it should be just right below the video that you're watching right now. You can click this here and it'll take you to the Teespring store where you can buy it. It is a digital download, so they will send you the PDF through your email when you purchase it. It'll of course mean the world to me if you check it out and buy it. It really does help the channel a lot and I would greatly appreciate it. But now, on to the video. The politics and intricate fractional differences between the inhabitants of the lower realms can be lost on many adventurers. Devils and demons are vastly different creatures. Devils are creatures of law who inhabit the Nine Hells. They are strict, organized, and rule-abiding fiends. Demons, on the other hand, are creatures of chaos. They are instinctual, decentralized, power-hungry fiends. The devils are governed by strict hierarchies. Demons are ruled by strength. These distinctions are the first things any good and studious planner theorist will learn, but things get a bit more complicated than that. See, the word demon is most often used to describe the race of creatures which live in the abyss. But see, demon is not actually a race. If anything, it might be best used as a nationality of sorts. If you live in the abyss, you are a demon. If you're molded and influenced by the abyss, you are demonic. But within this spectrum lies already a vast number of different creatures which belong to different groups. There are demons that used to be angels, for example, and those who used to be devils. 
by far the most populous kind of demon that exists are the ones we call Tenari, because Tenari are the demons that are born from humanoid souls. When a human soul finds its way into the abyss, it turns into a larva, which eventually turns into a main or into another kind of Tenari demon. These are the demons you know, the Baylors, the Barlguras, the Marilids. Those are all Tenari demons because they come from humanoid souls. But within all those demons you know, there are some that are a bit more different. Demons that are unique, demons that are older than most other demons. These are the Oberiths, who do not come from humanoid souls. They are not devils or angels either, so the question is, where did they come from? Well, they are the ones that turned the abyss into what it is today, and so our story takes us to them, and for that, we're going to go back. Far, far back to the very dawn of time as we know it. In an entirely different multiverse lived this group of creatures called the Oberiths. They are described as being revolting, like the very nature of their existence exudes wrongness. They don't have a defined shape and each particular Oberith is unique. Most of them share features similar to that of insects and crustaceans, but formed in all the wrong ways to the point that even just gazing at them could make a person go mad. Oberith had dominated their multiverse and effectively had caused it to die. With the last lights of their worlds diminishing, the race started to go extinct and so they planned a way in which to effectively hop into a new dimension so as to conquer it and continue on existing. For this, they created a shard of pure evil, made with the souls and essences of probably billions of their own race. This shard had effectively the power to unmake entire realities. The power of this shard allowed it to hop dimensions, but the shard itself had to be planted by a creature of power on the other side for the Overwatch to be able to use it as a portal, and so they devised a trap. The Overwatch, using the power of the Shard of Pure Evil, enthralled and corrupted a god in our dimension, a god who you might actually be acquainted with, Tharistoon. It's easy to miss, but he shows up in Princess of the Apocalypse. Etharisdom is the real persona of the entity that you might know as the Elder Elemental Evil. But regardless, back then he was just a god who desired for more, and so he fell for the call of the Overits. All Tharisdun needed to do was grab the Shard of Pure Evil and plant it in the center of the Astral Plane. This would have activated the power of the Shard and corrupted the Astral with evil, spreading in all directions and corrupting the whole of the multiverse, from which the Overits would then have been able to transport from. Instead, Tharisdun betrayed the Overits and attempted to consume the power of the Shard for himself and carved his own realm deep within the primordial soup of the elemental chaos. By Tharisdun activating the power of the Shard, it allowed the Overits to use it as a portal like they had planned, but instead of the Shard corrupting all of reality, its power was fueling a god, and so the Overits found themselves fighting this god for control over the Shard. The corrupting powers of the artifact had been used on the elemental chaos and now creating plane after plane after plane with it at its center and so was the primordial abyss formed. Even though things were not going according to plan, the Overith dimension was collapsing and so they had no choice but to completely abandon their worlds and move on to this new dimension, even if it meant fighting this all power hungry god for it. Eventually, after eons of combat, the Overits were proving victorious in their conquest, and from the hordes of demons, one managed to collect a shard, the one who would become the very first demon prince. The Overit's name was Obox Ob. As he obtained the shard, he collected unparalleled power from it, and so the plan continued to plant the Shard of Pure Evil into the heart of the Astral Plane, for if he succeeded, he would be able to control all of reality and become the overlord of this dimension. But demons do as demons do. And one thing that you will learn from this story is that generally a demon's greatest threat is not those from without, but instead those from within. Demons 
fight demons. And that started with the Overits as well. Many opposed Obox of from leaving the Abyss and planting the shard into the Astral. Power hungry demons that they are, they wanted the power for themselves. Hordes of demons and primordials battled against Obox Ob until they managed to fling him and the shard right into the vortex from which the abyss had been spawned. This vortex, however, did not lead any more into the original dimension of the Overit since that reality had already collapsed by this point. And so, instead, the vortex created a massive fissure into reality. The shard fell into this vortex, further and further down, creating what we call the Grand Abyss. And many of the most powerful Ovrids and Primordials dove down into the vortex to claim the shard, but the farther down they went, the weaker they became. Eventually, demon lord after demon lord would stop going down into the Grand Abyss, fearing for their lives as their energies were being drained. And since that moment, even the most powerful of demon lord had stopped the search for the Shard of Pure Evil, in fears of what they may find at the deepest bottom of the vortex. And the Shard simply burrowed ever so deep into the deepest foundations of chaos. To give you an idea of just how powerful this shard is, Asmodeus, the now lord and ruler of the Nine Hells, has a single powerful magical artifact, the Ruby Rod, which you of course know. It is believed that the ruby on the rod has a very small fragment of the shard of pure evil in it, and this shard gave him the power he needed to oust the last ruler of the Nine Hells, kill him and erase his memory from existence, and further now he uses the rod with a fragment in there to basically control all other devils. In any case, life settled on the abyss, and the Overeds reigned supreme. Uh, most of the darker sections of the Abyss were still far too dangerous for even the Overits to contend with, and so most of them lived in the first layer, known as Pesunia, or the Plain of Infinite Portals. It was in here that they formed their cities and their massive citadels. Many of the pits on this layer opened to portals which led deeper into the sections of the Abyss, and so Overits would construct their citadels on these pits in order to control the comings and goings of demons throughout the realm. They also underwent a massive project to dig and further open this Grand Abyss, which is the biggest pit where the Shard of Pure Evil fell. They built bridges and fortifications throughout the upper sections of the Grand Abyss in order to control more of the many portals which open in this section. They figured that control over the means of transportation through the lair meant control over the realm, which held true for eons. The problem was... Tharis Dun was not fully defeated, and he had a plan. Tharis Dun knew that he could not contend with the full might of the Overeds on his own, and so he formulated a plan to enlist the help of both Primordials and Elementals. He did this by assuming a new identity, one known as the Elder Elemental Evil, where he convinced these Primordials were already pretty upset at the gods for a taking over the multiverse, that if they could obtain the Shard of Pure Evil, they could potentially defeat the gods. And so a massive army of Primordials and Elementals was formed, which inevitably ended up forming into the war which we today know as the Dawn War, the war between the gods and the Primordials. This war was pretty massive, and most of what transpired in there is not actually part of this video, but it is one of the most important historical moments of Dungeons and Dragons lore. The part that interests this video comes when the gods realized who was behind the movement, which was Tharis Dune, and so they ended up imprisoning him. Thing is, this did not really fully end the conflict. The great war between law and chaos had begun, and on the side of chaos, the abyss was right in its center. After more eons of conflict, a particularly important Overith started to take center stage, the one who would be known as the Queen of Chaos, for she discovered a new truth about reality that was about to change the way this war was fought and would change the abyss forever. See, mortal life started to form on the material plane, and the queen discovered that when these mortals died and their souls made it into the abyss, a new type of demon was being created, the Tanari. 
The Queen cultivated this new breed of demons using the Ovrith Flesh Warpers to grant them different shapes depending on the need. It is believed that the very first Tenari demon born was Demogorgon, who the Queen discarded for being deformed and uncontrollable. Some of the most famous Tenari shapes that you know nowadays come from the transformations that the Queen of Chaos enacted upon these creatures on their nascent days, and you can even see that some Tenari demons were given shapes similar to that of the Ovrids, like the Glabresus who show crustacean features. With this new, seemingly endless source of souls which you could turn into demons, the Queen of Chaos was preparing to take the conflict between law and chaos onto the next level. She started amassing forces in the millions, consolidating power between the Ovrids and conquering layer after layer on the Abyss. In order to do this, she delivered a surprise attack onto Obox Ob, the Prince of Demons, who was still very much alive. She needed to send a message. If you were not with her, you were against her. And her sudden strike proved to be fortuitous. She defeated Obox Ob and destroyed most of its form, leaving only a small and weakened vestige left which scurried into the deepest bowels of the darkness. The Queen of Chaos was very clever. Now with Obox Ob out of the picture, all the Overids realized that if she had the power to end such a powerful creature, no one could stand against her. Further, she allowed a Tenari demon that was loyal to her, one named Miska the Wolf Spider, to absorb the essence and title of Prince of Demons, ensuring the loyalty of all Tenari demons while simultaneously obtaining a powerful lieutenant to fight for her. The Abyss was rallied behind the Queen of Chaos, the armies started to march, and what came after almost unraveled creation, as the multiverse will have never seen the likes of the war that was about to unfold. The battle between law and chaos was about to reach its end. With the Prince of Demons at her side, the scale was tipped against a law. Miska's savage demon hordes brought territory and converts, particularly in the material plane, and even the gods seemed hard-pressed to stop them from taking the Astral Sea. World after world fell, and with each loss for law, the once immutable rules of the cosmos became fluid and forgotten. Chaos was ascending, the abyss going with it, and all seemed lost until a fateful battle at the fields of Pesh ended the eon-long conflict. On the material plane world of Oerth, one rich with magic and possibility, in the shadows of the mighty volcano known as the White Plume Mountain, a final battle against the agents of order known as the Windows of Aqua commenced. The battle was said to have spanned the astral plane, but in the end, using a powerful artifact called the Rod of Law, the Wind Dukes imprisoned Miska in the plane of Pandemonium, causing the forces of Chaos to scatter and retreat. The demons retreated back to the abyss, including the Queen of Chaos, who now found herself with her armies decimated and the alliance left in shambles. Fortunately for them, the power of law is weak in the realm of chaos. No angel who values their lives would find themselves in the abyss. Such would be suicide. Their power would weaken and their flesh would corrupt. No matter the size of the army, they would surely find death within the realm of chaos, and so the Overeats would find true defeat not from law, but from chaos itself. The Fairy Queen of the Court of Stars, Morwell, sensed weakness within the ranks of the Overeats and decided that now was the time to strike. The Eladrin, the celestial elves from Arvoria, went to war. Being chaotic creatures, they were resistant to the detrimental effects of the Abyss and sent their celestial armies to rain down upon Pasunia. The Eladrin Knights devastated the powerful fortresses of the Ovrids and systematically decimated them by controlling the first layer, which had access to all the portals leading into many of the deeper realms. Ironically, however, it was not the Eladrin who delivered the final nail in the coffin of the Ovrids. Instead, it was the Tanari demons, who up until this point had been slaves to the power of the Ovrids. The Tanari demons finally sensed it was their time to revel against their masters, and in a massive realm-wide revolt, the Tanari finished off most of the remaining Ovrids as they attempted to escape the wrath of the Eladrin. This 
was the end for the Overits. The never-ending swarm of Tanari demons coming from the deepest bowels of the Abyss were just too much for even the Eladrin to handle and so they were also repelled and for the first time in existence, the Tanari ruled the Abyss. The few surviving Overits that still exist to this day do so by keeping their real personas secret, making sure to hide any and all trace of their Overith descent. Others maintain their safety by working directly with Tenari demon lords. Dagon, for example, a powerful seer, gives Demogorgon knowledge in exchange for protection. Others, like the Pale Knight, allegedly became a consort to Baphomet, even if just for a while. Pasusu allied with the Tenari and has been able to keep his descent mostly a secret. Obox Up still lives, a fraction of the grand creature he used to be, skulking ever so weak like a maggot clinging to life. The Queen of Chaos retreated to the 14th layer of the Abyss, called the Steaming Fend, where she still plots to this day for a way to free Miska and restart the war once again. With the Overids out of the picture, the Tanari demons quickly fell into infighting, as demons always do, in a bid to find who amongst them were to become the new Prince of Demons. From the murky shadows of the Abyss, the first Tanari ever born, the one discarded by the Queen of Chaos eons ago, had risen into a powerful behemoth. Dima Gorgon would then go on to claim this title and rule over demons even to this day. The war between Law and Chaos would never end, however, as since the dawn of time, the two conflicting principles would seek to end each other until the end of existence. From the battle between primordials versus gods, to the battles between the Overits and the Celestials, to the modern version of this conflict which now takes on the form of the Blood War, the conflict between the devils and the demons. A conflict which will war ab nauseum. And throughout all of this, the seed of evil that spawned the Abyss simply cleaves its way through the cosmos, steadily increasing the Abyss's size even as other forces act against it. Unseen and unstoppable, its whispers urging demons to destroy, promising ultimate power to the one who could conquer all of the Abyss, something not even the Overits once came close to doing. The few remaining Overits have made a secret pact that if any of them ever were to claim the Shard, they would all work together this time and bring the Shard to the Astral and finally lay claim to this reality. It is said that if they were to ever seize the Shard, then not even the alliance of the multiverse's mightiest beings would be able to oppose them, as their horrific shapes would resurge and spread across the cosmos once more. Thank you guys so much for watching. Of course, make sure to go and check the PDF. It's just right there below the video. You cannot miss it. I would greatly appreciate it if you guys do. I would also like to personally thank my patron supporters, Barry Maskin, 5e Magic Shop, Morgan Johnson, Rusty Rain, Doc Feeder, The Great Codini, Omega Scales, Terry Kolb, Benjamin Bosters, Falky951, Ordoric, Prince Daylight Morning Crown, Sabim Kurshap, Solarensis, Thomas Hunt, Nathan McComb, Solus Rider, Lost Crusader, Stalia, Olaf Klepp, JD Green, Trev909, Tony Arcee, Famine52, George Fotlin, Sovereign Mind, Trevor Hest, Nato Rashura, Brian Camp, Shad Aga, John the Wicked, Shane and Sam Skinner, Steven, The Living Guild Pack, Michael Walker, Streblo, Describe, Herbert Johnson, The Wizard's Vault, James the Perverted, Shoddycast, Horrorbound, Jesse Feliziano, Helian Vantamane, Munchkin Mania, and Barrack for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please, please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Thank you guys for watching, thank you guys for being here, thank you for being awesome, and I will see you all next week.